Hi, I'm Jonathan Crystal. I'm the interim provost here at Fordham. And um, I want to welcome all of you to the 2019 Fordham Distinguished Lecture on Disability. A few access notes before we begin. There are ASL interpreters and CART available at the front of the room. We have access copies in 12 and 18 point font for anyone who would benefit from having a hard copy of the text of this evening's lecture. Um, please indicate if you'd like to have one passed to you. Okay. Thanks. So there's also space at the back of the room for anyone who needs to move around. This lecture is organized by the Fordham Faculty Working Group on Disability, a university-wide group supported by the Provost's Office. This year's event was also made possible through the support of Fordham's Chief Diversity Officer, Rafael Zapata, who just walked in somewhere. Um, now in its fourth year, Fordham's Distinguished Lecture on Disability series is part of a growing range of activities and initiatives around disability on campus. The faculty working group also sponsors an interdisciplinary research seminar series and events organized for students, including film screenings and discussion panels, as well as initiatives to improve the accessibility of our campus community. You can find out more about their activities by going to the website called Fordham Disability Scholarship Cluster or by emailing disabilitycluster at fordham.edu. This year, we're very excited to announce a new disability studies minor. The minor offers students a truly interdisciplinary opportunity to engage with questions about the meanings and experiences of disability through coursework, on-campus programming, and participation in the broader community of disability studies scholarship in New York City. Information about the program can be found on the flyers outside or by searching online for the Fordham Disability Studies minor. Uh, we encourage you to get in touch if you're interested in learning more about that. In addition to these faculty-driven initiatives, we have a fantastic student organization, the Students for Disability Advocacy Club, that is actively working to create a culture of accessibility here at Fordham. Flyers with more information about their activities are also available on the table outside. Turning to this evening's activities, tonight's event will take place in two parts. Um, uh, from 6 to 7.15, we have the lecture and a Q&A, moderated by Dennis Tyler. Professor Tyler is Associate Professor of English here at Fordham. His work on African American literature and culture, disability studies, performance studies, and popular culture has appeared in African American Review, Journal of Literary and Cultural Disability Studies, and American Literary History, among other journals. And his book, Disabilities of Color, is forthcoming with New York University Press. Following the Q&A, we will have a reception in the back of the room. Now, let me introduce our distinguished speaker. We are thrilled to have Eli Clare here with us this evening. Eli is a writer, activist, and teacher whose work opens new avenues of discussion on disability, gender, sexuality, race, and environmentalism. In addition to presenting work across the US and Canada, Eli is the author of three books, The Poetry Collection, The Marrow's Telling, Words in Motion, and two works of creative nonfiction, Exile and Pride, Disability, Queerness, and Liberation, and Brilliant Imperfection, Grappling with Cure, both of which use innovative hybrid forms to raise vital questions about how we story disability in our society. These are texts that challenge us to think deeply about the ways that racism, ableism, homophobia, and transphobia shape our perceptions of what constitutes a normal body, mind, or a valuable life. And that both describe and experiment with the kinds of relationship and community that merge in spaces of multiple marginalization. As disability artist Petra Cuppers describes in a response to Brilliant Imperfection in Syndicate, Eli's gift is to bind experiences, longings, and desires to a deeply felt sense of the injustices, exclusions, and unmarked sites of violence that surround us. We are excited this evening to hear more about that work. Please join me in welcoming Eli Clare to Fordham. Ted 
technology this iPad has decided not to. There we go. Hi. 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 It's great to be here at Fordham. Um, I first want to thank everyone who made this, made my visit here possible today. It's such a tremendous amount of labor that goes into an event like this. I also want to thank the people who built and maintained this building, who cleaned this room. All of that labor makes our presence here possible. I also want to acknowledge that this event is happening on stolen land. This is the land of the Lenape occupied territory of the Lenape. And that acknowledgement always needs to happen. And the responsibility to that acknowledgement, particularly for those of us who are white settlers here, is tremendous. A um, couple more access notes. For those of you who can hear, how is my volume right now? If that changes, let me know. Holler, wave your hands, do whatever you need to do to catch my attention. But you know, don't throw rotten tomatoes. They just make a mess. Um, I'm going to do a bit of audio description on on the PowerPoint slides. So the photograph on this title slide that said Notes on Cure, Disability, and Natural World, a talk by Eli Claire, with my email address under my name, and that email address is Eli at EliClaire.com. The photograph is a color photo of a tall grass prairie. There's tall green grasses um, meeting a white gray sky. And then the foreground is an orange and black monarch butterfly sitting on an orange and yellow flower. And here's the next access piece. If people would like to access a hard copy of this talk online, here are um, URLs for both a 12-point font version and an 18-point font version. The, and I'm going to read these URLs um, as part of creating more access. The 12-point font URL is https colon slash slash tiny URL dot com slash y six x j three c s d and for the eighteen point font it's the tiny URL dot com slash the last piece of it is y six a K E U Y X. Feel free to download the copies, use them personally, but please don't share or particularly repost them online. So I think those are the access notes. Um, the last thing I want to say before we get started is that we're living in scary and dangerous times. Scarier and more dangerous for some of us than for others of us. That, that scariness and danger is not equal for all of us depending on who we are and where we live. There's more or less danger, but we're living in tumultuous, scary, dangerous times. And, you know, we could spend the next hour talking about that chaos 
on two more. We could talk about family separation at the border. We could talk about um, Islamophobia. We could talk about racism. We could talk about raving, rising hate crime rates. Um, but what I want to do is remind all of us that we are living in a time of tremendous resistance. When I talk to my activist elders, people who have been working for liberation and social justice for 40 and 50 years, they, what they say to me is the resistance looks stronger than it looked in 40 years. We're living in a time of tremendous resistance. And acts of resistance can re be really, really tiny and daily and can be really big and one time and everything in between. And my greatest hope for tonight is that something is said or done or questioned or taken apart in a way that strengthens our resistance. So I'm going to be reading a talk entitled Notes on Cure, Disability, and Natural World that comes in eight parts. I'm trying to think of the only thing you need to know right now. Oh, I use the phrase body-mind to resist the white western impulse to say bodies live here and minds live here and they have nothing to do with each other. You know, we have Descartes to thank for that. And in my experience and in the experiences of mainly people I share a community with, bodies and minds aren't two distinct entities. They are one tangled, complicated, complex, ambiguous, contradictory entity. So I use the phrase body-mind to <coughs> flag that. So, one, prayers, crystals, vitamins. Strangers offer me Christian prayers or crystals and vitamins, always with the same intent, to touch me, fix me, mend my cerebral palsy, if only I will comply. They cry over me, wrap, my, wrap their arms around my shoulders, kiss my cheek. After five decades of these kinds of interactions, I still don't know how to rebuff their pity, how to tell them the simple truth that I'm not broken. Even if there were a cure for brain cells that died at birth, I'd refuse. And let me pause here. This talk in large part is about cure. So when I say cure, I mean C-U-R-E. And I say that because often when I say cure, people hear care, and then nothing I say makes sense. <laughs> care needs to be talked about, but what I'm talking about tonight is cure. Even if there were a cure for brain cells that died at birth, I'd refuse. I have no idea who I'd be without my tremoring, tense muscles, slurring tongue. They assume me unnatural, want to make me normal, take for granted the need and desire for cure. Strangers asked, What's your defect? To them, my body-mind just doesn't work right. Defect 
being another variation of broken, supposedly neutral. Let's think of the things called defective. The MP3 player that won't turn on, the car that never ran reliably, the end up in the bottom drawer, dumpster, scrapyard. Defects are disposable and abnormal, body minds or objects to eradicate. Strangers pat me on the head. They whisper platitudes in my ear, cliches about courage and inspiration. They enthuse about how remarkable I am. They declare me special. Not long ago, a white woman wearing green catcher earrings and a fringed leather tunic with a medicine wheel painted on its back grabbing in a bear hug. She told me that I, like all people who tremor, was a natural shaman. I'm not making this story up. You know, I'm not confabulating details. I'm not making it bigger than it is. This actually happens. You know, it's the kind of crap that I couldn't make up even if I tried. She told me that I, like all people who tremor, was a natural shaman. Yes, a shaman. In that split second, racism and ableism tumbled into each other yet again. The entitlement that leads white people to co-opt indigenous spiritualities tangling into the ableist stereotypes that bestow disabled people with spiritual qualities. She whispered in my ear that if I were trained, I could become a great healer, directing me never to forget my specialness. Oh, how special disabled people are. We have special education, special needs, special spiritual abilities. That word drips condes condescension. It's no better than being defective. And the, the content note, this next paragraph includes some racist and ableist language and I'm going to say those words out loud rather than use euphemisms. Strangers, neighbors, and bullies have long called me retard. It doesn't happen so often now. Still, there's a guy down the road who, when he's drunk, taunts me as I walk by with my dog. But when I was a child, retard was a daily occurrence. Once on a camping trip with my family, I joined a whole crowd of kids playing tag in and around a picnic shelter. A slow, clumsy nine-year-old, I quickly became it. I chased and chased, but caught no one. The game turned. Kids came close, ducked away, yelling, retard. Frustrated, I yelled back for a while. Retard became monkey. My playmates circled me. Their words became a torrent. You're a monkey, monkey, monkey. I gulped, I choked, I sobbed. Frustration, shame, humiliation swallowed me. My body mind crumpled. It lasted two minutes or two hours. I don't know. When my father appeared, the circle scattered. Even that the word monkey connected me to the non-human natural world, I became supremely unnatural. All these kids, adults, strangers, 
join a legacy of naming all disabled people and non-disabled people of color not quite human. They approach me with prayers and vitamins, taunts and the endless questions, convinced that I'm special, an inspiration, a tragedy in need of cure, disposable, broken, the momentum of centuries behind them. Two, the restoration of health. And an ideology seeped into every corner of white Western thought and culture. Here rides on the back of normal and natural. Insidious and pervasive, it impacts most of us. In response, we need neither a wholehearted acceptance nor an outright rejection of care, but rather a broad-based grappling. The American Heritage Dictionary defines care as, quote, the restoration of health, end quote. Those three words seem simple enough, but actually health is a mire. I could try to determine who's healthy and who's not, acting as if there might be a single objective <coughs> standard. I could struggle to clarify the relationship between health and disability. I could work as many activists and healers do to redefine health, moving toward theories and practices that contribute to the well-being of the entire communities. But then using the American Heritage Dictionary definition as a springboard, actually what I want is to move away from this mire altogether and follow the word restoration. To restore a house that's falling down or a tall grass prairie ecosystem that's been devastated is to return it to an earlier and often better condition. In this return, we try to undo the damage, wishing the damage had never happened. Talk to anyone who does restoration work, carpenters who rebuild 150-year-old neglected houses, or conservation biologists who turn agribusiness cornfields back to tall grass prairie, and they'll say it's a complex undertaking, a fluid, responsive process. Restoration requires digging into the past, stretching toward the future, working hard in the present. And the end results rarely, if ever, match the original state. Restoring a tall grass prairie means rebuilding a dynamic system that has been destroyed by the near extinction of bison, the presence of cattle, and generations of agribusiness farming and fire suppression. The goal isn't to recreate a static landscape somehow frozen in time, but rather to foster dynamic interdependencies ranging from clods of dirt to towering thunderheads, tiny microbes to herds of bison. This work builds upon knowledge about and experience with an 8,000-year-old ecosystem of which only remnants remain, isolated pockets of red plants milkweed, burrows, and switchgrass growing in cemeteries and on remote bluffs, somehow miraculously surviving. The intention is to mirror this historical ecosystem as closely as possible, even though some element is bound to be missing or different, the return close but not complete. I circle back 
did the ideology of cure, framing it as the kind of restoration revealed the most obvious and essential tenets. First, cure requires damage, locating the harm entirely within individual human body minds, operating as if each person were her own ecosystem. Second, it grounds itself in an original state of being, relying upon the belief that what existed before is superior to what exists currently. And finally, it seeks to return what is damaged to that former state of being. But for some of us, even if we accept disability as damage to individual body minds, these tenants quickly become tangled because an original non-disabled state of being doesn't exist. How would I, or the medical industrial complex, go about restoring my body mind? The vision of me without tremoring hands and slurred speech, with more balance and coordination, doesn't originate from my visceral history. Rather, it arises from an imagination of what I should be like from some definition of normal and natural. So I want to pause here and check in about my volume. How is my volume? Okay, great. So this is part three, Walking in the Prairie. My friend Jay and I walk in the summer rain through a 30-acre pocket of tall grass prairie that was not so long ago one big agribusiness cornfield. We follow the path mowed at the fire break. He carries a big flowered umbrella. Water droplets hang on the grasses. Spider webs glint. The bee balm hasn't blossomed yet. He points out the numerous patches of birch, goldenrod, and thistle. The first two belong here but need to be thinned out. The thistle, on the other hand, should be entirely uprooted. The Canada wild rye waves, the big blue stem almost open. Clusters of sunflowers brighten the rainy day. We pause to admire the cornflowers and the asters. The songbirds and butterflies have taken shelter. But the moment all is quiet. Soon my jeans are sopping wet from the knees down. This little piece of prairie is utterly different from a cornfield. A whole group of people, including Jay, worked for over a decade to restore this land. With financial and material help from the Wisconsin's Department of Natural Resources, they mowed and burned the cornfield. They broadcast the seed, sack upon sack of the right mix that might replicate the tall grass prairie that was once here. They rooted out thistle and prickly ash. They saved money for more seed, working to undo the two centuries of environmental destruction wreaked by plows, pesticides, acres upon acres of soybean and corn. The Department of Natural Resources partners with this work precisely because the damage is so great. Without the massive web of prairie roots to anchor the earth, the land now known as Wisconsin is literally draining away. Rain catches the topsoil 
Washington from field to creek to river to ocean. Prairie restoration reverses this process both stabilizing and creating soil. Jay and his friends worked hard, remembering all the while that neither they nor the dairy farmer down the road owned this land. It was stolen a century and a half ago from the Eastern Dakota people. The histories of grass, dirt, by the massacre, genocide, live here, floating in the air, tunneling into the earth. During my visits to CJ, I have taken this walk a dozen times over the last 15 years. At noon, with the sun blazing, at dusk, with fireflies lacing the grasses, at dawn, with finches and warblers greeting the day. My feet still feel the old cornfield furrows. As we return to the farmhouse, I think about natural and unnatural, trying to grasp their meanings. Is an agribusiness cornfield unnatural, a restored prairie natural? How about the abundance of thistle, absence of bison, those old corn furrows? What was once normal here? What can we consider normal now? Are all the, these the wrong questions? Maybe the earth just holds layer upon layer of history. Four, wishing you less pain. You and I know each other through a loose national network of queer disability activists made possible by the internet. Online, one evening, I received a message from you containing the cyber equivalent of a long, anguished moan of physical pain. You explain that you're having a bad pain day, and it helps to acknowledge the need to howl. Before I log off, I type you a good night, wish you a little less pain with the morning. Later, you thank me for not wishing you a pain-free day. You, you say, the question isn't whether I'm in pain, but rather how much. As I get to know you in person, you tell me, I read medical journals hoping for a breakthrough in pain treatment that might make a difference. You work to locate a doctor who might believe your reports of pain, work to create the appropriate script, the exact words and story that will open the door, lead doctors to treat you as a patient rather than a drug-seeking criminal, work to obtain the necessary scripts, the actual prescriptions, work to find the right balance of narcotics. You work and work and work some more. The rhetoric of mentally disability activists declares there's nothing wrong with disabled body minds even as we differ from what's considered normal. I have used this line myself more than once, to which you respond, resisting the assumption that we are wrong and broken makes sense. But the chronic fatiguing how pain I live with is not a healthy variation, not a natural body-mind difference. I grasp at the meanings of natural and the unnatural again. The moments and locations where disability and chronic pain occur can we consider the natural as our fragile 
resilient human body-mind interact with the world? Is it natural when the spine breaks when, excuse me, is it natural when the spine snaps after being flown from a car or a horse? When the brain processes information in fragmented ways after being exposed to lead, mercury, pesticides, can the body-mind both be deemed natural and abnormal? I ask because I don't understand. And when are those moments and locations of disability and chronic pain unnatural, as unnatural as war, toxic landfills, child abuse, and poverty. Five, cautionary tale. You and I meet at the disability community event. We end up in a long conversation about shame and love. You tell me that the military dumped trichloroethylene near your childhood home, that chemical leaching into the groundwater and shaping your disabled body-mind as you floated in the euro. When you talk to people about this pollution and its impact, they most often respond with pity, turning you and your wheelchair into a tragedy. As you tell me this story, I think of a series of the advertisements in the Sierra Club's campaign, Beyond Call. And on the slide that I just changed is the first of two ads that I'm going to be talking about, and the, I'll be auto-describing this image right now in the text of the talk. In one advertisement, the tagline reads, quote, asthma, birth defects, cancer, enough, end quote. Superimposed over a looming smoke belching power plant. And I just changed the slide to the second advertisement. And another, we see the big belly of a pregnant woman dressed in pink, one hand cupping her stomach. Her skin is flat brown, her face is invisible, her belly is captioned, quote, this little bundle of joy is now a reservoir of mercury. End quote. The fine print tells us, quote, mercury pollution from our nation's coal burning power plants is harming pregnant women and their unborn children. Mercury is a powerful neurotoxin that can damage the brain and nervous system, causing developmental problems and learning disabilities. End quote. To persuade viewers that these plants need to be shut down, both ads use disability to make an argument about the consequences of environmental destruction. There is so much to pull apart here about gender and race. The second ad relies on stereotypes about femininity and the supposed vulnerability of women and children, and the justifies a woman of color, reducing her to a body part, which is then further reduced to a reservoir. And at the center of this argument is disability. And I've changed the slide to, so that we can see both advertisements side by side as I um, further think about them. Seemingly, the ads ask us to act in alliance with people 
most impacted by the burning of coal. People of color and poor people who all too often work amidst and live near environmental damage. But digging down a bit, the Sierra Club twists away from solidarity, focusing instead on particular kinds of body-mind conditions, asthma, birth defects, cancer, learning disabilities, transforming them into symbols of environmental damage. The strategy works because it taps into ableism. It assumes that viewers will automatically understand disability and chronic illness to be a tragedy in need of prevention and eradication, and that this tragedy will persuade us to join the struggle. Certainly, ending environmental destruction will prevent some body-mind conditions. But by bluntly using ableism, that conflates justice with the eradication of disability. The price disabled and chronically ill people pay for this argument is high. It reduces our experiences of breathing, of living with conditions deemed birth defects, of having cancer, of learning on a multitude of ways to proofs of injustice. This reduction disregards ableism as a primary location of the problem, problem in big air quotes, the problem of disability. It ignores the brilliant imperfection of our lives. It declares us as unnatural as coal burning power plants. The price of this argument would be one thing if it occurred in isolation, but the Sierra Club's rhetoric is only a single example in a long line of public health campaigns against drug dr drunk driving, drug use, lead paint, asbestos, unsafe sex, and on and on. To use disability and chronic illness as a cautionary tale. Amidst this cacophony, you want to know how to express your hatred of military pollution without feeling the assumption that your body-mind is tragic wrong and unnatural. No easy answers exist. You and I talk intensely. Both the emotions and the ideas are dense. We arrive at a slogan for you. I hate the military. I love my body. Undoubtedly, we could have come up with a catchier or more complex slogan. Undoubtedly, we could have done that. But at the same time, it lays bare an essential question. How do we witness, name, and resist the injustices that reshape and damage all kinds of body minds, plant and animal, organic and inorganic, non-human and human, while not equating disability with injustice? So I, I just changed the slide back to the picture of the tall grass prairie that was on the title of the slide so that we don't have to look at these ads as, as I finish this talk. So there are two more parts to the talk. Six, body mind union. The desire for cure, for the restoration of the health, is connected to loss and yearning. What we remember about our body minds in the past seduces us. We wish, we mourn, we make deals. We desire to return to the days before immo immobilizing exhaustion or impending death. To the nights 30 years ago, when we spun across the dance floor. 
We dream about the bothered minds we once had before depression descended, before we gained 20, 50, 100 pounds. We ache for the evenings curled up in bed with a book before the ability to read vanished in an instant before a landmine or bomb exploded. We reach toward the past and dream about the future, feeling grief and the shame. We compare our body minds to friends and lovers, models in the magazines, glamour and men's health, Photoshop versions of humans hold sway. We find ourselves lacking. The gym, diet plan, miracle care grip us. Normal and natural won't leave us alone. We remain tethered to our body minds of the past, wanting to transport them into the future, imagining in the essence a kind of time travel. Even without a non-disabled past tugging at me, I too find myself yearning. Occasionally, I wish I could step into the powerful grace of a gymnast or rock climber, but that wish is distant, fading away almost as soon as I recognize it. Sometimes in the face of a task I can't do, Frustration overwhelms me, and I wish for steady, nimble hands. But in those moments, I have learned to turn away from bitterness and simply ask for help. At the same time, my most persistent longing centers on body-mind change. As my wrists, elbows, and shoulders have grown stiff and sore. I've had to stop kayaking. It's a small loss in the scheme of things, but I do miss gliding on the rippling surface of a lake, the rhythm of my paddle dipping in and out of the water. Here is such a compelling response to body-mind loss, precisely because it promises us our imagined time travel. But this promise can also devalue our present day body minds. It can lead to dismiss the lessons we've learned, knowledge gained, scars acquired. It can bind us to the past and glorify the future. It can feel hope grounded in nothing but the shadows of natural and normal. And when this time travel doesn't work or simply or simply isn't possible, we need a thousand ways to process the grief prompted by body mind loss. Seven yearning for the paper pond. The connections between loss, yearning, and restoration aren't only about human body minds. Memory that's more in the vacant lots, woods, and swamps we play in as children, now transformed into landfills, strip malls, and parking lots. We fear the wide-reaching impacts of climate change as hurricanes grow more frequent glaciers melt and deserts expand. We long for the days when bison roam the Great Plains and Chinook salmon swim upstream the millions. We desire a return. And so environmentalists partly motivated by this longing, has started to learn the art and science of ecological restoration. They broadcast tall, tall grass prairie seeds, raise and release wolves, bison, whooping cranes. They tear up drainage piles and reroute 
water back into what used to be wetlands. They'd pick up trash, blow up dams, plant trees, hoping beyond hope that they can restore ecosystems to some semblance of the former selves before the white colonialist capitalist industrial damage was done. When it works, restoration can be a powerful force contributing to the Earth's well-being, as well as providing an antidote to loss. But the damage can be irreversible, some ecosystems irreplaceable. Restoration may take centuries, maybe a band-aid stuck onto a gaping wound. We may not be able to fix what has been broken. Below my house, on the edge of the cow pastures, there used to be a little swampy pond surrounded by cattails, where in the early spring, right now in Vermont, right now, actually this week, where in early spring, just after the ice melted, hundreds of peepers would breed. These small, light brown frogs would sing through the night. Sometimes I'd walk down to the pond and stand for 10 or 15 minutes, surrounded, surrounded by their chorus, eardrums and chest reverberating, shoes growing soggy. Two summers ago, neighbors built a house down there. I watched the structure go up, but didn't register what it might mean for the peepers. Last spring, I headed down to the pond as usual, tromping through the upper field, then the hedgerow, coming out at the western edge of the cow pastures. But there was no pond, no course of peepers, falling silent as I approached. I wandered around for a while, feeling disoriented, before I realized that my neighbor's backyard was exactly where the peeper pond used to be. It's a tiny loss in the scheme of things. This patch of land occupied Abenaki territory has endured so much ecological change in the almost four centuries since white people stole it. We've clear-cut it three times, fenced it with stone walls, hedgerows, barbed wire, planted grass, put sheep and cows out to graze, built houses and barns and wetlands, created manure piles, drugged for water, leaked gas, made garbage heaps of wire, glass, mattresses, tires, railroad ties, bulldozed roads. More than enough damage has been done, and yet many native plants and animals are somehow doing well, including the peepers. Still, I miss this particular peeper pond, yearning to stand again at its edge, listening. There's no return to the time before my neighbor's house, before the cows and sheep, before white people arrived. Instead, I carry these losses with me. I'm slowly learning the importance of bearing witness a quiet daily recognition so different from the desire to repair. And let these losses sit uncomfortably in my heart. And at the same time, I walk in the woods, I recycle, I take to the streets to shut down the natural gas pipeline that the Vermont Gas Company wants to build, not far from here. I grow kale and beets in my backyard. I join the solar electric co-op down the road. 
I remember the Abenaki Nation had not vanished, four bands making home on the land currently known as Vermont. They relearned the old traditions and they're creating new ones. They've gained recognition from the state government. They've acquired in recent years several pieces of land, one of them an old burial site, and another a sacred spot they frequented for thousands of years. They join indigenous peoples from all over the world in finding many ways to survive, to cultivate well-being, to defend their sovereignty. And still, there's no return to the past. I remember my conversation with a woman whose body and mind has been shaped by military pollution. Remember the slogan, I hate the military and love my body. I said with the question, how do we witness, name, and resist the injustices that reshape and damage all kinds of body, minds, plant and animal, organic and inorganic? <coughs> Excuse me. Non-human and human while well, not equating disability with injustice. I feel my grief and rage over environmental losses as small as the disappearance of a single beaver pond and as big as the widespread poisoning of the planet's groundwater. I think about how we might bear witness to body-mind loss while also loving ourselves just as we are right now. I begin to understand restoration both of ecosystems and of health as one particular relationship between the past, present, and future. Thank you.